This video is titled, Mobile HF Batteries and Alternators. Warning, we're talking about electricity. Use proper precaution. Let's first discuss alternators. Peak amperage rating ranges from 100 to as high as 250. These high output ratings weren't meant for us amateurs. Instead, they're intended to provide the necessary power to defrost your windows, power your navigation system, heat your seats, and all the rest of the accessories we've been accustomed to. In addition, more and more vehicles are being equipped with electrical driven water pumps, power steering motors, and even power assist brakes. In the old days, all cars were equipped with an ammeter connected between the battery and the generator. Today, a more meaningful indication is a DC voltmeter, but manufacturers rely instead on an idiot light. Since we're not idiots, we need to add a voltmeter to be safe and not stranded with a dead battery. If the vehicle doesn't stay above 13 volts DC or more at 2500 RPM while you're transmitting, you might not have enough reserve power for your rig. Fortunately, most rigs nowadays shut down when the voltage drops below 11.6 volts. The voltage should remain about 14 volts even with the lights and air conditioning on because we typically don't run all of our accessories at the same time there's usually enough capacity left over to power even moderately powered amateur transceivers in some cases a lot more determining if you have enough capacity isn't all that difficult if you use some basic logic if your car has a rear window defogger you have about 30 amps reserve that is enough for the late model 100 watt transceivers like the ft100 the ft 857 d the IC706 and the IC7000 and even the 200 watt TS480 talking on the radio while in heavy traffic should be discouraged due in part to the distraction it causes when your full attention should be on safe driving further air conditioning cooling fan headlights and slow engine speed all add up to low alternator reserve when in doubt err on the side of safety and hang up the mic if you think you have alternator whining it should sound like this Wine can be caused by a large spike in the AC component, as shown on the oscilloscope. A very rare occurrence nowadays, and one which typically turns on the check engine light. This said, almost without exception, alternator wine is caused by a ground loop. In most cases, the wine is only apparent on the transmitted signal, which is another indication of a ground loop problem. If this is the case, chances are the cause in the use of a mag mount or a poor RF ground return. Also, Jim Perkins, KB1MVX, came up with a neat little circuit. Gets rid of a lot of the noise. It will become apparent that wiring amateur radio equipment in late model vehicles is becoming more difficult and exacting. With that thought in mind, here are the salient points to remember. Never use any existing wiring to power any amateur radio gear. The chassis of the vehicle should never be used as a ground return. The wire should be connected directly to the battery or jump point as the case may be. Wiring should be done in a way to avoid circumventing any battery monitoring system. Direct connection to an output of a voltage stabilizing system should be done only with the advice of a vehicle dealer's personnel. The wiring should be sized large enough to limit voltage drop to less than 0.5 volts while under full load. Wire must be properly fused to protect it from shorts. Avoid using circuit breakers no matter what rating. The wiring needs to be protected from abrasions, excessive heat, and automobile chemicals. The wiring should be routed in a neat and tidy manner to avoid interaction with passengers and mechanical devices. The wiring insulation temperature rating should be at least 90C, 195 degrees Fahrenheit, in the passenger compartment, and at least 105C, 220 Fahrenheit, in the engine compartment. Termination lugs should be properly crimped and or soldered. Regular inspection and or scheduled maintenance of wiring is an important undertaking. So let's go play in the devil's playground. Never use existing wiring to power amateur radio transceivers. This includes accessories, cigarette lighter sockets. Typically wired with 16 gauge wire, they're inadequate to handle even the average current draw of an amateur HF transceiver, much less the peaks, no matter its power rating or fuse size. If you do, you run a very great risk of causing electrical fire, the most costly of vehicle repairs and the most traumatic as well. So let's discuss power connections. There are two schools of thought with respect to where the power cable ground of an amateur radio transceiver should be connected, but both agree that the chassis should not be used as a ground return. While this practice is widespread in the past, doing so in a modern vehicle should be avoided at all costs. It is important to remember that today's vehicles are rolling computers, with some models having as many as 80 CPUs controlling everything from ABS to VSS. Each one of these CPUs 
Cruz has a sensor connected to it, which controls every facet of operation. Using the chassis for a ground return can cause a ground loop to occur, which can corrupt the data from them. The first school of thought is to connect the negative lead directly to the battery. ICOM, Yezu, and Kenwood all recommend this method, as does every automobile manufacturer. However, this method requires that the negative lead be fused. The second school of thought is to connect the ground lead to the battery's chassis ground point. The negative lead doesn't need to be fused in this case. Both methods work equally well. However, on most newer vehicles with idle engine shutoff, both methods require scrutiny, high power or not. Let's discuss what size wire to use. Most modern amateur radio transceivers universally operate on normal 13.8 DC. On a mobile scenario, that normal voltage actually varies from below battery resting voltage, 12.2, to as high as 14.4 when the alternator is charging the battery. If we allow the voltage to drop much lower than 11.6 volts, most transceivers will simply shut off. Also at a low voltage, the power output drops. Thus it behooves us to minimize the voltage drop of our wire. The rule of thumb is not more than 0.5 volts. With that in mind, we need to know peak current draw. In both cases, the manufacturer's published figures are close enough. For the average 100 watt transceiver, the peak current is approximately 22 amps, which includes some prosthetic draw like the cooling fan. A 50 watt FM transmitter is about half, half that or 11 amps. Here is the formula for calculating the voltage drop for any given size and length of wire, including the slight drop due to the fuse and their holder. For the record, voltage drop is frequently referred to in amateur literature as I squared R losses, but I squared R actually refers to power loss. So here's the formula. If you don't want to do all the math, there's a very nice website to calculate it out for you. It's www.calculator.net forward slash voltage slash drop slash calculator dot html or another way to get you in the ballpark is this chart which gives you a reference wire for a particular amperage and length for example an hf transceiver running 25 amps going 10 feet would need a 10 gauge wire and a vhf radio running typically 15 amps peak would only need a 14 gauge wire for the same 10 foot run Another reason to shoot for less voltage drop is temperature rise, since an automotive environment is hotter than a base one. Oversized wire, less resistance, will keep temperature rise to a minimum. Too hot of a temperature rise and the insulation could melt. Minimal voltage drop is even more important if you're using an amplifier. For example, an HF 500 watt mobile amplifier draws between 25 and 40 amps average, with peaks above 100 amps, including the driving transceiver. Again, the wire selection should be based on peak power draw, not the average. This is why a trunk mounted battery is a mainstay for high power installations. Even then the main feed from the front battery should be at least number six wire and preferably number four. Without a second battery, two aught wire is needed to achieve the same minimum voltage drop. Let's talk about wire termination. Wire terminations are an important part of any mobile installation, yet it is the one item most often short-circuited. Especially important are the heavy-duty leads directly from the battery or jump point to where the transceiver is located because it's often a necessity to transition between large and small gauges. While some folks use butt splices for the transitions, they are difficult to solder. And in some cases, mechanical clamping alone doesn't provide the best connections. Some of the best terminal devices are based around the Anderson power pole connectors, but a caveat or two are in order. First, some types are not completely sealed, so they need to be placed in such a manner to prevent any object from dropping on their potential exposed connector, however unlikely. Secondly, some of the various models are marketed using pre-installed cables which are usually too short and require butt splices to attach them to the power source. Extending the cable's length also increases the I squared R losses. So proper sizing is important. If possible, choose one without a built-in primary cable and add your own in an exact length and size required. Power distribution blocks come in all shapes and sizes, mostly used in the car stereo industry, but will work in amateur radio applications as well. They come from basic blocks to ones with fuses and meters. The caveat on these is because they're using bare wire, they're prone to dirt and moisture. 
Whenever possible, I suggest using ring connectors rather than spade type connectors because they stay put even if the connector loosens. All connectors should be both crimped and soldered to ensure strength and a low resistive connection. It's also a good idea to use a star washer under the lug to ensure a tight connection. When using ring terminals, always use the rule of 45. 45 degrees maximum between the ring connections. Regardless of your connection type, inspection of all the wires and fuse holders should be carried out at least once a year. This may require removing and reinserting fuses in their fuse holder. This is especially important when using tubular fuses, housed in spring-loaded or inline holders. The inspection should also include looking at the discolored parts, which might indicate a loose connection or overload condition. Let's not forget, there is a need to use a master fuse mounted close to the battery. Most people don't fully understand what a fuse does or why it's necessary. A fuse is generally inserted into electrical circuit for two reasons. Either to protect the power supply, which includes the wire that connects the power supply, to the electrical device, or to protect the electronic equipment. The electronic equipment manufacturer specifies a fuse rating to open an electrical circuit before damage can be done to the device, or to open the circuit if the electronic device fails in some way. There are six basic types of blade fuses. They are the maxi fuse, the ATO fuse, sometimes called the regular fuse, the mini, the low profile mini, the micro three fuse, and the micro two fuse. The three basic fuses are the maxi, the regular or the ATO, and the mini. The nice thing about blade fuses is they're color coded. The regular fuse or the ATO fuse has ratings from 0.5 amps all the way to 40 amps, whereas the mini goes from two amps to 40 amps. And let's not forget the maxi, that starts out at 20 amps and works its way up to 120 amps. Then there's AGU fuses. This is a larger glass fuse and typically has a rating between 10 and 80 amps, mostly used for the main power wire coming from the battery. There are two important specifications for a fuse. The first is simply the current rating. Fuses are rated for a given number of amps. The second specification is voltage. This isn't really important if you're simply replacing the fuse that has blown with the same type. Fuses typically used in automobiles are generally rated well below 100 volts. Now we're going to show you a couple of simple circuits. In the first diagram, one of the most important things to understand here is that segment A is not protected in any way. If it were to be shorted to ground, either the wire or the battery would be damaged. In either case, there would most likely be some kind of electrical fire. This is why the wire must be short. 12 to 18 inches is the maximum recommended. Now this diagram is a little bit more complicated. As you can see, wire segment A is used to deliver power to the fuse within 18 inches of the battery. Wire A is also large enough to power two rigs. Fuse A must be rated to protect wire B, and fuse B protects wire C, and fuse C protects wire D, and thus both rigs are protected. All fuses exhibit a time delay between any given ampere overload and when the fuse opens. This delay is called ampere squared seconds and is expressed as I to the second T. For example, a normal 20 amp fuse will handle a 30 amp load for about 90 seconds. It will hold a 100 amp load for about one second. Just after the fuse element melts, there will be a brief short period of time when an arc occurs, after which the fuse opens the circuit completely. Most amateur transceivers DC cords are built using 10 gauge wire. Further, most are about 9 feet long, and most are fused at 30 amps. If you subject them to 22 amps of current, they'll exhibit about a half a volt drop. This means the power cable will be dissipating about 11 watts. If we subject the cable to a load of 100 amps, where the fuse would normally would require 3 seconds to open, our voltage drop would be 2 volts, and our wire has to sustain 200 watts of dissipation. So where does the wire go? With very few exceptions, the vehicle battery is located under the hood. But wherever it's located, the connection should be neat, clean, properly fused, and clear of obstructions. Split loom can be purchased at a mobile sound shop and should be used to cover the wires. Routing the wire through the firewall must be neat and tidy and as direct as possible as well as being properly grommeted to avoid abrasions and the possibility of a short circuit. Unfortunately manufacturers don't design vehicles for inclusion of amateur radio. In some cases they purposely leave an unused hole to facilitate high-end stereo equipment but that is the exception not the rule. Without the extra hole most amateurs resort to using existing wiring grommets which is not recommended. When drilling a hole into the firewall stay away from the upper part of the firewall as the area inlet is there as well as the windshield wiper assembly. Also stay away from any portions of the firewall that are a double firewall. Double walled firewalls are common in modern vehicles.
Best size hole to put in for the firewall is a three quarter inch, which happens to be the same size as an NMO mount. Once you've drilled the hole and the edges are cleaned up, install a three quarter inch ID grommet. To make it easier to pull, put a dab of number 77 wire lube on a rag and wipe it down the outside of the wire. This is slick. In almost all cases, the amount of wire needed from the firewall out will be much less than behind the firewall. In other words, feed the wire from the passenger compartment through the firewall to the fuse holder location and then its final destination. Correctly installed wiring means it should be out of sight, protected from abrasions and sharp edges, and positioned in such a way to eliminate trip hazards and interference from the vehicle's wiring and controls. This requires forethought and patience, and should never be done hurriedly. Running power cables hither and yarn is a prescription for disaster. Individual runs may be strapped together with commercial grade tie wraps. This should be done after all the runs are installed. Don't use vinyl tape to secure cables as it will not stand up well in the automotive environment. If you have to use tape, use Scotch 27 high temperature glass tape. And above all, remember neatness counts. Make sure all turns are gradual. Avoid sharp edges and pinch areas. Use split tubing whenever possible and especially at interface points that cannot be avoided. Grounds are the most misunderstood subject in amateur radio. Amateurs deal with a variety of grounds including earth ground, DC ground, RF ground, ground planes, chassis ground, isolated ground, and a few others. No wonder why there's so much confusion about which ground is which. Of all the varieties of ground we deal with in mobile operations, the most important one is ground plane, essentially the missing half of a vertical antenna. But before we go much further, a myth needs to be dispelled. RF ground in the form of a ground strap is not the same thing as a ground plane, nor will it take the place of one. In other words, a ground strap attaches between the antenna's mounting hardware and the nearest hard point will not replace or substitute for an adequate ground plane under the antenna. Remember this is an important point. It's the mass under the antenna, not alongside, that counts. Maximizing antenna efficiency should be the holy grail of every mobile operator because ground losses dominate the efficiency equation. Decreasing them by 1 ohm can make a significant difference. Further, excessive ground loss directly relates to the level of common mode current. Common mode current causes all sorts of RFI issues, both ingress and egress, and can dramatically reduce SNR. This point should not be underestimated. Put another way, excessive ground losses can turn an otherwise efficient antenna into a poor one. A few salient points need to be made here. A vehicle is in an adequate ground plane at any frequency under 100 megahertz, no matter how large it is. Rather, it acts like a capacitor placed between the antenna and the surface under the vehicle, which is the actual ground plane. Since the surface in question is a poor conductor of RF, ground losses will occur. Secondly, RF must flow back to the source. It'll do so in the shortest path it can find, ideally within the superstructure of the vehicle the antenna is mounted on. However, improper mounting causes an inordinate amount to flow outside the coax or down inadequately choked motor control leads. The term ground plane is a bit of a misnomer, but is used to differentiate DC from RF ground. Although it is common to describe an elevated ground plane as a counterpoise, in the case of mobile installations, it's a misnomer. Now many amateurs harbor the notion that DC grounding an antenna will magically act as or replace a ground plane. It will not. The only way a ground strap could act as or replace a ground plane is to make it long enough to be a radial. That's a ridiculous notion. While the DC strap may indeed DC ground the antenna base, and it might RF ground it too, depending on its length and width versus the frequency of operation, it is by no means a replacement for a ground plane, nor is it a substructure for proper bonding. There is only one RF ground we need to deal with, and that's a proper return for the coax. It should be very close to the base of the antenna, coincident to any matching device used, and most importantly, as close to the metal mass of the vehicle as possible. Put another way, if your antenna mount is securely fastened to the frame of the vehicle, and the coax is securely fastened to the mount, no additional grounding is needed. There is one more thing to consider when the coax shield connection is raised above the ground plane. Not only are the ground losses increased, the amount of RF flowing to the motor control leads also increases, as do common mode currents flow on the coax. Therefore, obviously, this premise negates mounting antennas atop large posts, extended brackets, clamps, and luggage racks. Another misunderstood aspect is adding DC ground to various transceiver parts in effort to control RFI and or high SWR. If a DC ground addresses your RFI or SWR problem, then something else in your installation is incorrectly installed or mounted.
The ground plane is one type of ground that needs a different name applied to it. Because everyone seems to have a different opinion of what it is. Or is not. It isn't a counterpoise. Although many folks use the term synonymously, it isn't a ground strap to the nearest hard point either. In an HF mobile scenario, the body of the vehicle and the capacitive coupling to the surface under the vehicle is acting as a ground plane. And a lousy one at that. On the average, mobile ground plane losses vary between 2 and 10 ohms. 10 through 80 meters respectively. In most installations, the ground losses are somewhat higher due to improper mounting, bonding, and assume ground conductivity. This fact is why proper bonding and mounting are of prime importance. The issue is to make all of the bolted pieces as RF conjointed as we can. Here's another way of thinking about the system. Let's assume our antenna represents a 50 ohm load, which it seldom does, and our transceiver's output is 100 watts. From Ohm's law, flowing into the antenna will be 1.4 amps of current at 75 volts. The same current and voltage must flow in the missing half of the antenna the ground plane as it were. Since both our antenna and ground plane are lossy, some of the current will be dispersed as heat and will not be radiated. Quite obviously, we want to minimize these losses. Your average vehicle. First of all, there is no average vehicle. In fact, between two otherwise identical vehicles, there can be great differences in the amount, the type, and severity of RFI. For example, the egressed ignition RFI may be S9 on one and S2 on the other. Even minor annoyances like the fuel pump and AC fan hash vary greatly from model to model. They are, after all, screwed together. The same thing can be said about ingresses, especially sound systems. Secondly, the suggestion that one specific model or brand is superior to another doesn't take the aforementioned facts into account. This begs the question, is one generally better than the other? Well, maybe, but we have to be more specific. In this case, we're speaking about ground planes, and to a lesser degree, RFI issues. With that in mind, we can make a few general statements. As a rule, unibody vehicles exhibit less problems, both in ingress and egress RFI. This is due mainly to the all-welded body construction. However, most still have sound isolation undercarriages from the suspension, engine, transaxle, and exhaust system, etc. And these need to be bonded to maximize RF conductivity. Body-on-body -body vehicles tend to be more bolted on pieces, and this is especially true of pickups. No matter where you mount your antenna on a pickup, the bed should be bonded to the chassis on all four corners, and the cab on both sides. If you don't, you'll most likely be plagued by RF problems, some of which you won't know you even have. One major point to remember, DC connectivity is not the same as RF connectivity. When you improperly bond or wire your insulation, it's possible to create a ground loop with the vehicle's superstructure. When you create a ground loop, the resulting effect will often appear to be RFI. This is the reason ground loops are the toughest problems to find incorrect. Thus, under no circumstances should the body and or frame be used as a path for DC ground return. Doing so on a modern vehicle is a prescription for RFI and operational problems with various onboard electronics. Returns should always be run directly to the battery or jump point as the case dictates. There are other components that you can add to a car's electrical system to enhance its ability, like auxiliary batteries, battery isolators, and battery boosters. This video is just giving you a quick overview. And if all else fails, talk to a professional car stereo installer or a mechanic when it comes to your amateur radio installation needs. I hope this video has been helpful. And 7.3s from N9LVS.